Welcome to the CDA Institute's Expert Series, the podcast that brings you critical discussions with thought leaders in defense, security, and global affairs. The CDA Institute encourages rigorous debate on national security matters through our events, research, and publications. In today's episode, Gord Venner, Vice Chair of the CDA Institute, moderates a discussion on the upcoming NATO Summit in Washington and what Canada can expect with fellow CDA board members Stephanie Von Plackey, Kerry Buck, and Vincent Rigby. The NATO Summit will take place Tuesday, July 9th to the 11th. This is the Expert Series. Good day. My name is Gordon Venner. I'm the Vice Chairman of the Board of Directors of the Conference of Defense Associations Institute, the Ottawa-based think tank which focuses on defense and national security issues. In today's CDAI podcast, I am joined by Kerry Buck, former Canadian ambassador to NATO, Vincent Rigby, former national security and intelligence advisor to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, and Professor Stephanie Von Hepke of Queen's University in Kingston, whose work focuses on NATO gender issues and defense policy. We will discuss today the upcoming NATO Leaders Summit in Washington and the implications for Canada of the issues being discussed there. I would like to start today by asking each of the members of the panel to say a few words about the geostrategic climate in which this summit is being convened. I think Canadians understand, generally speaking, that the world has become a more dangerous and unstable place. In recent months, they have seen the crisis in Ukraine heightened as the persistence of Russian aggression has tested the resolve and the determination of Ukraine and its supporters. Canadians have also seen the crisis in Israel and Gaza devolve into a humanitarian tragedy of staggering proportions. And of course, they watched as China responded to election results in Taiwan with intimidating displays of military force. And yet, all of these events may still seem a long way from home. And the domestic agenda, with uh, persistent inflation and high interest rates and foreign interference in our domestic politics, eats up a lot of bandwidth. So let me ask each of you, uh, how worried should Canadians be about the strategic environment at the moment? Vince, maybe maybe you could lead us off. Sure. Well, thanks, Gord. Appreciate that. And great to to be here and join my colleagues. I think you kind of answered the question to a certain extent just with your opening remarks and doing that quick tour d'horizon of some of the crisis points around the world right now. Um, it, it's hard to talk about this period without falling back onto, onto cliches. And so I think that's one of the problems right now is that the Canadian public continues to hear that, that we're living in a very dangerous and, and unstable and unpredictable world. Um, we hear Joe Biden going on about rat and selection point. I noticed that that phraseology is also used in the recent defense update that we're at net and selection point. The Germans like to use the term called Zeitenwend, which is, I think, I'm not very good at German, but I think that translates into a turning point, et cetera. Um, So it is a, it is a scary, a scary world. I, I think that uh, we have to educate Canadians just to how scary it, it actually is. And without becoming a fear monger, you have to, I think articulate that in my view, this is as dangerous a period as we've seen since the end of the second world war. And that often raises eyebrows whenever I say that to my students now, or when I say publicly, people say, well, come on, uh, we lived through 45 years of a cold war on, on the razor's edge of nuclear conflagration. We had Cuban missile crisis and Suez, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But as I think we all know, there was a certain predictability Um, there was a certain stability to the Cold War. Yes, granted, it was based on mutually assured destruction, which is not a good thing. Uh, But the fact of the matter is there there was always a sense that there were certain rules to the game. And there was a certain simplicity in the sense that you had the West and you had the Soviet Union and the war stuff. I think nowadays you almost feel like the geostrategic environment is played on a three or four dimensional chessboard. And it's just it's just so much more complicated so that yes you have the west and you have russia but you also have the west and china you have the west and iran you have the west and north korea and so this plays out on so many different so many different fronts and so you know in the context of 
of the Washington summit, you can say, well, okay, all kinds of bad things are happening in the world, but NATO should be focused on the North Atlantic and NATO should be focused on Europe in particular, given what's happened in Ukraine. But as, as the NATO secretary general likes to say, there's no such thing as regional security anymore. It's all, it's all global security at the end of the day. So who supports Russia militarily? Well, China, Iran, and North Korea. And so it's hard to isolate anything geographically. And those countries that I just mentioned, uh, China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea, um, there's not a strategic partnership amongst the four of them. You can even argue that there's no strategic partnership between China and Russia, but they are certainly talking to each other and they're certainly working together. And so um, that creates uh, a new a new complexity to the world, I, I think. And, and you're seeing that, I think, reflected in the fact that that NATO has invited in you know certain Indo-Pacific countries to this this summit in Washington in a in a couple of weeks, um, New Zealand, Australia. I think uh, Japan, and South Korea, if I'm not mistaken. So I think that NATO, NATO gets that. So yeah, it, it's it's a it's a scary place right now. I, I think it is it is at it is at an inflection point to fall back on that on that cliche again. And what's really been getting to me lately, Gordon, and I'll 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 stop talking. But um, just watching Europe and these conversations, in fact, they're beyond conversations right now. Countries actually pursuing conscription. And you're starting to see that debate even in Canada. There was a there was a, an op-ed in the Saturday Globe, I think, about a month ago about should we have conscription in Canada? And can you imagine five, ten years ago talking about potentially having conscription? Um, you know, and some of the some of the countries that are pursuing conscription are in NATO. So um, so yeah, I think we've got to articulate this. You don't want to be a fear monger, but it's difficult not to to be rather dark at this period in time. So I'll stop there. Yeah, thanks for that, uh, Vince. Uh, you make a couple of good points. Uh, like you, I've uh, been conscious, seems that every summit, whether it's a, a NATO summit or a G7 summit or the UNGA meetings in the fall, everyone is an inflection point. Um, everyone is is about uh, you know the state of crisis. And it's hard to know sometimes uh, how real all of that is. Uh, at the same time, you know, you quite rightly point out that crisis seems to have been globalized along with a lot of other things. Uh, and we see evidence of that both in our own relationships, but in what we see other people doing in the expansion of the BRICS, for example, to to include a lot more parties. So uh, I mean, that does mean that there's a constant need to to keep reassessing the situation and and moving forward. And that'll be that'll be a challenge for NATO leaders. Um, Carrie, do you have further observations on that, or do you want to uh, comment on anything that uh, that Vince has made has said there? Well, I'd just like to carry forward that thread that you raised, Gord, about Canadians and what Canadians think and feel. We've had the luxury of our geography for a very long time. Um, we're protected uh, by our geography, and we're protected. We have been protected by our neighbor to the south. And even during the Cold War, the threat of nuclear Armageddon seemed remote. Um, but we are living in a very, very different world now of problems without passports. There are new threat vectors that ignore borders. Uh, they require collective response. Um, pandemic was one example. Climate change is another example. Um, cyber uh, disinformation, a lot of those things you mentioned, Gord. So the stuff that happens outside has a direct and often negative impact on Canadians' economy and security every single day. Spike in food prices, part of that, a big part of it, can be walked back to uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, for instance, uh, and uh, disruption of supply chains, for instance, by the Houthis. So... Um, you know, and I could go on to explain how Canadians' pocketbooks and Canadians' sense of security, faith in their elections, faith in being free from uh, foreign interference, all those are shaken by things that happen outside. So our geography has collapsed for us. We have to act like we're part of the world, uh, understand that we um, need to work with other allies to... Um, come up with collective responses to a lot of those uh, problems without passports. So uh, the summit comes at an interesting time. It's the 75th anniversary. And you can say, well, 
you know, is it fair to ask if a 75-year-old uh, lion's built for the Cold War can serve, um, you know, Canada's changing security interests and needs? Um, and I think the resounding answer on that is is yes. Um, NATO is the alliance that keeps on finding a reason to exist. Um, so the summit comes at a point where it has to grapple not only with a new hot war on in Europe for the first time since the Second World War, but that other host of threat vectors that I talked about. So it really has been adapting and has to adapt more. What does it do on cyber? How can NATO help to um, act when the UN Security Council can't? Um, how can it uh, help allies share best practices in countering disinformation? How can you, we protect our critical infrastructure, cyber, undersea cables? And the list goes on. So uh, we used to joke at NATO, um, you know, every summit, as you said, Gord, was an inflection point. Sometimes we'd have bets with money uh, on the ambassador's table. Oh, who's the first person to mention inflection point? But this time it really, really is. Great. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, and you make a very good point that um, part of the challenge at the moment is that, uh, I mean, superpowers and, and, and major countries' alliances have always had the ability to shape global events. Um, that's not new. But if you can do it uh, because you're you know, a small non-state actor and you've got access to a few well-armed drones uh, that you bought a radio shack, um, then maybe uh, the complexity of trying to ensure uh, global order and stability uh, is just getting a little bit beyond the capacity of uh, of the the normal the traditional actors to uh, to to handle it. Uh, Stephanie, do you have uh, further thoughts? Yes, I'm really happy that uh, Carrie mentioned this with the. 75th anniversary of, of NATO, because I think this is a, an opportune time to ask how successful NATO has been at adapting to different threats and different changes in the uh, geostrategic environment. And it is more complex. So I'll echo Vince there. You know, when you look at this renewed focus on the eastern flank, well, of course, that's not the only area of focus. And we'll see that at the summit, no doubt. Uh, there is going to be a renewed conversation on the southern flank. There was a group of experts that was commissioned to study the issue. The uh, great power competition is playing out there, too. You look at the northern flank, it's going to be even more important now as a microcosm of uh, geopolitical tension for NATO because of the new members with Finland and Sweden. You've got a united NATO northern group of countries and so how is that going to play out for Canada? We certainly saw that articulated in Canada's defense policy update. Uh, the fact that there's this reference to the northern and either, even the western flank. So all this to say that, you know, when we compare the situation now with the Cold War, there is this uh, multipolar great power competition playing out across different flanks, uh, speaking to the complexity that was raised earlier. In addition to that, this is playing out not only in terms of traditional domains of operations, but across multiple domains of operations, including cyber and, and, and information. Uh, and then the final uh, layer of complexity that we really need to pay attention to is, is the political complexity. 1949, we're starting with 12 founding members. Now there's 32 member states. So the political coordination there, the game at 32 member states is a lot more complex and one could argue slower. Uh, so there's been a big focus too on, on how to improve enhanced political dialogue within NATO and how to enhance the mechanisms for political coordination. But that also introduces a level of political complexity uh, in terms of alliance decision making and expediency. We also have to look at which elections are looming. There's a lot of elections in the NATO landscape uh, in 2024 and 2025. So a lot could change and that introduces a lot of unpredictability. Can I, can I jump in? And, and no, I think that, that um, Carrie and Stephanie have raised some really good points about sort of hybrid warfare and, and some of these things that are really having an impact domestically. 
And we're seeing that playing out in Canada, certainly with respect to foreign interference and cyber attacks and disinformation. But let's not also forget that that um, I talked about living on the razor's edge with respect to nuclear conflagration during the Cold War, that you've you still got nuclear weapons and they're proliferating. And a lot of the regimes surrounding nuclear weapons are in decay and falling apart. Some have fallen apart completely. So in addition to everything else we've talked about, this is almost like the icing on the cake, is you have a modernization of nuclear arsenals. China, of course, is modernizing very, very quickly. Russia, United States, uh, North Korea is a nuclear power. Iran is, uh, you know, a hair's breadth away from from having nuclear weapons. So this just is is really uh, one more thing that uh, we have to worry about. And so um, I think there was always a sense that during the Cold War, as as Kerry said, I mean, I think we all lived through the Cold War. Most of us did. Um, uh, and, and I don't ever remember being truly, truly scared that the war was about to break out, um, nuclear exchange. But but nowadays, when you, it, when you hear Putin threatening the use of tactical nuclear weapons every every other week, and you're seeing these nuclear arsenals growing, and again the cracks in the in the regimes, um, it's 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 again adding just yet another another layer of fear and apprehension, I think. And so, um, if if there's a miscalculation, like we've often said in the context of Ukraine, uh, with respect to how much NATO might want to get involved in the Ukraine. Um, situation. Um, it is uh, it is a, a very very scary proposition that we could be one one mistake away from a nuclear exchange. And you know, again, if we had been saying that 10, 15 years ago, we probably would have rolled all their eyes and go, "Come on!" But now it's a reality. It truly really is a reality. So one more thing. Yeah, thanks for that. That's a that's a sobering reminder, um, and even more so when we consider. Uh, the, the problems in cyberspace and outer space, um, outer space having, you know, really uh, received a lot of attention recently, given uh, some of the focus in the United States Congress on uh, possible Russian activities in, in uh, outer space. Um, and then the intersectionality of all three of those things, nuclear, cyber, and, and outer space all sort of coming together is, uh, is a pretty scary prospect. Um, so... With that in mind, though, let me let me try and move on a little bit here uh, to the summit itself. Um, Carrie, maybe I'd ask you to kick this off, but I'd like to know from each of you what do you think is most likely to come out of the summit? I mean, what is the is the best we can hope for, and where is the common ground to be found uh, among the leaders to try and uh, improve the the geostrategic climate at at the moment? I expect the summit to focus on four areas. On Ukraine, um, there won't be an invitation to join or to launch accession talks. That's my informed guess. But I think that the summit will go pretty far in sending as clear signals as consensus will allow uh, to Ukraine uh, at a minimum promise them a bridge to membership. Uh, the language I understand is still being worked out, but there'll be establishment of a new NATO mission that will coordinate all forms of assistance to Ukraine, including coordination of those security guarantees that were called for by the G7 a year ago, training, and of course, weaponry. That co uh, kind of coordination is already happening under a US-led process, but the fact of turning uh, this into or adding a NATO mission to the coordination is important for a couple of reasons. One, um, in the event that the U.S. turns more radically isolationist and uh, does something bad, once again, with their support for Ukraine, uh, having NATO take that on will be important. Um, and I think that's an important, uh, almost political signal. Um, the second thing is that some areas that aren't coordinated by Ramstein need to be, by the U.S. lead, -led process, need to be coordinated like uh, training. So that's good if it comes out. There'll also be a financial pledge to uh, Ukraine. Um, second area will be, of course, burden sharing, which is code for spend more money on defense. We can talk about that in more detail. Third, on deterrence and defense. 
think there'll be a lot more on defense production because it's lagging in NATO, more on readiness, more on protecting critical infrastructure, and more on plussing up the really incredible growth of deterrence uh, along all flanks of, uh, of NATO um, in response, not just to Russian uh, aggression, but also to turbulence uh, on the south flank, as Stephanie said. And then the last area will be global partners. And here, there'll be two focuses. One is it will be on Middle East and, and the region. Part of that will be county, countering Russia in the region. Um, and then, uh, obviously, in continuation from Madrid, a focus on China. Um, China, not just language, talking about the challenge, security challenge it po poses, but also a lot more uh, NATO activity on those um, areas that aren't traditional domains, but areas where China's already active and already actively causing direct problems for NATO allies, cyber and space, for instance. So those are the four areas I expect. Um, the thing I'll be watching is for continuation of NATO unity. And there's some worries, some trends there. Hungary may seek to um, uh, exclude itself from some of the support to Ukraine, the new NATO mission for Ukraine. Um, that's a worrisome precedent. Um, it's a way of consensus minus one, but that has to be finessed, I think. Uh, we'll see how far the French lead, newfound French leadership on Ukraine carries. Uh, the French proposal on training inside Ukraine, I understand, is getting lukewarm response. Um, and then overall, we'll look for American confirmations of its commitment to NATO, which I think are important signals before the U.S. election. The fact is that the war in Ukraine is, is grinding on, and the longer it grinds on, the higher the risk of fraying of NATO unity. Putin is counting on it. That's part of his plan. And so it'll be very important to watch how that NATO unity holds across not just the Russia issue, more deterrence and defense, but also across the whole of the issues that the alliance is dealing with. So that's a really high level um, kind of impression of what I expect to see out of the Senate. Uh, thanks, Jerry. I mean, you, you covered off a lot when you said uh, progress on all flanks. Um, yeah. You, you didn't uh, refer to the Arctic uh, specifically. Um, but there are, as you say, when you, you've covered off all flanks, you've done a lot. Um, you did refer to uh, China uh, specifically, and that sort of takes us back to the conversation we had at the beginning about, uh, you know, this being a, a summit where the, the crises are globalized um, and uh, NATO is going to have to try and reconcile that with its uh, regional, with its regional mandate. Uh, so it would be fascinating to see how that how that plays out. Uh, Stephanie, have you got any thoughts on that? I think Gary provided a, a really good and comprehensive overview of what we can expect uh, in terms of the summit. However, I would say that uh, I don't expect too many uh, surprises uh, at, at the summit. I think that what was articulated in the latest iteration of the strategic concept, we're going to see reinforced at this uh, yeah. summit in 2024. Uh, so a big focus on uh, collective defense and deterrence and the latest measures that are meant to enhance that, especially on, on the eastern flank. Uh, the work is far from done uh, as we see that the battle groups scale up to brigades and these multinational uh, teams being assembled uh, from, from uh, the north part of the eastern flank to the south. Uh, so I think that that's always a good opportunity to kind of signal the extent to which uh, uh, conventional deterrence is is very important in the uh, deterrence equation and collective defense equation. Uh, I do think that where we're likely to see a bit more new information is on the the, the southern flank conversation. So, in the uh, group of expert report that I referenced earlier, there were um, so there was some praise for the NATO mission in Iraq. And here is ways that NATO can have uh, more targeted impacts uh, in, in the region, in the Middle East, North Africa, uh, through capacity building and advisory missions. And so 
NMI or the NATO mission in Iraq was quite small, but it was rooted in a uh, genuine partnership with the country and where NATO expertise was really leveraged for these capacity building and advisory tasks. So what I think we can expect from that conversation and those recommendations or perhaps other ways to uh, be able to design similar types of missions in other countries of the region, uh, just to make sure that NATO is, is uh, staying involved with various partners there. One thing that I'm asking myself about, uh, like two weeks away from the, the summit now, is whether there's going to be any special attention paid to uh, the new policy on women, peace, and security. So the last summit uh, declaration mentioned as an action item the need to review and to update the women, peace, and security agenda. And so what we can see and what we can expect to see in the policy, I think, is a document that is more closely aligned with the strategic concept, acknowledging that a lot has changed in the last two years and that the women, peace and security policy had not been uh, updated uh, in some time. Uh, and therefore, much like some of the other announcements uh, in declarations uh, for the 2024 summit, I think the strategic concept is kind of the, the guiding document and, and sets really the parameters uh, for the conversations to come. Lastly, I'll focus on, on values. There's going to be a lot of conversation on military capacity, burden sharing, the need to go well above the 2%. And for countries who don't have a plan yet to get there, to get a plan going. Uh, but I think that there's an opportunity here in this moment, and especially for the 75th anniversary, to really restate quite clearly the values that NATO stands for. That's important as a signal of political cohesion, which is constantly under attack by external forces, uh, and, uh, and also uh, as a crucial moment in time, understanding that uh, that political cohesion will be further strained with uh, the political landscape uh, probably shifting quite dramatically uh, in the next uh, 12 to 24 months. So I think that there's an opportunity here still within the parameters of what was agreed upon in the strategic concept to just restate really clearly the values uh, for which NATO stands and which were enshrined also in its foundational treaty. If I can, Gord, on that values point, I mean, President Biden has been framing NATO as kind of the antidote to that rivalry growing uh, conflict between democracy and autocracy, which I think is an interesting way of framing it. Um, makes a lot of historical sense, as we saw post-dissolution of the former Soviet Union states choosing to accede to NATO. It was a better model for them. And so at this current time, um, if the Russian approach to power can be described as based on spheres of influence, where weaker states don't have the right to choose their political path, their future, NATO provides a compelling counter-narrative. And I think that's a really important point to make now. Um, states are choosing, choosing to accede to the EU, choosing to come to NATO. Yeah, great, great point, Kerry, and, and one that... Um has application beyond the regional security context, the, the whole globalization of crisis issues. It, it, it's, a, it's a point that can be used uh, everywhere. Uh, Vince, do you have reflections on this? Well, I've got to say, um, I'm very humbled with Stephanie and Carrie because they, they know this topic inside out and they've covered the territory extremely well, but maybe just a few things. Uh, on my side. I mean, first and foremost, I think we have to remember that this is the 75th anniversary. So this will be uh, not a time to rest on your laurels, not a not a time to to pat yourself on the back about what a wonderful alliance is. But at the same time, it is a celebration of an alliance that's been around for 75 years and that's been enormously, enormously successful. And I think what they're probably going to play up to a considerable extent is how adaptable this alliance has been and how adaptable it's going to have to remain as we as we head into the future. So I think there will be a lot, a lot of hoopla and there, there will be a, a lot of, um, you know, this has been a tremendously successful alliance, perhaps the most successful military alliance in the history of the world, a defensive alliance uh, that is set up against Soviet aggression that that adapted after the Cold War um, to you know the, the war against terrorism. And now it's adapting back to more sort of great power rivalry. But I think that's something worth keeping in mind. And, and that emphasis on adaptability, it'll have to continue to be a flexible 
and nimble alliance. Um, I agree completely with Kerry. Uh, you know, Ukraine is not going to get their direct path to, to NATO membership. They'll get some kind of a bridge. I've, I've seen some of the stories as well with respect to this new NATO mission. I guess the $64,000 question is going to be, is this going to make Ukraine or Zelensky in particular happy? We know Zelensky was not happy after the last summit and he was quite public about that. So what's going to be his public reaction to this? And um, Kerry and and Stephanie probably have a better sense than I do as to what he may say this time. If he'll, if he'll keep his powder dry, he'll be a little bit more careful. But I think this mission will be important in standing it up, taking um, away some of the emphasis on the U.S. angle. But I think just as importantly is, is, is sending that message that NATO's in it for the long haul. And so it's it's about long term support. I mean, this war uh, could go on for another five years, um, if not if not longer. So we're we're there for the long haul and the emphasis on on long term. So, um, you know, what, as you said, uh, Kerry or Gordon, we'll talk about about capabilities and two percent and all that. Um, but just in terms of long term commitment to the enhanced forward presence countries and Canada, what it's doing in Latvia, that we're there, we're there for the long haul. In terms of being there. Completely agree that the cohesion of the alliance is going to be front and center. I, I think that, again, the alliance has been incredibly resilient and in many respects post-2022 has rediscovered itself and brought itself together. But you're seeing over the last six six months or so, if not longer, a little bit of those tensions reemerging. Um, I think as Stephanie mentioned, you know, a bit of a swing to the right with respect to recent elections, EU and otherwise governments that if they're not right-wing governments or coalitions with right-wing partners, um, tensions between Germany and France. Kerry mentioned Hungary. There's Turkey out there, which is always a bit of a wild card. So just keeping the alliance together and coming out with a strong message that we're in this, uh, not just with respect to Ukraine, but we're in this for the long haul as a defensive alliance that's there to protect our territory and to protect our values. I think it's going to be uh, really, really critical. And then finally, um, it will be interesting to see what what comes out on on the Indo-Pacific and China and the fact that you do have the IP4 there and how much further we go on on on, on China. I mean, it's in the strategic concept now and it's been identified as a, as a country of concern. I think Kerry's right, sort of cyber and so on will, will be there, but uh, I'll be curious to see if they go any further than that with respect to the Indo-Pacific region. And again, all the, all the support that China and North Korea are giving to Russia. I think that the, you know, the, the Russia and North Korean nexus that we've seen really play up in the last couple of weeks could be quite prominent at, in Washington in some discussions about that. So it should be interesting. Thank you, uh, Vince. So let me just turn to uh, something a little bit closer to home now. Uh, Stephanie earlier on uh, referred to uh, the government's announcement of its defense policy update, uh, which had uh, a focus on the North. Um, the uh, they met with um, mixed reactions, um, including the very predictable reaction that it didn't lay out uh, an immediate path to try and move Canadian uh, defense spending to uh, a target of 2% of, of GDP. And in keeping with what Vince was just saying, um, you know, if NATO is going to demonstrate resolve and commitment, uh, an awful lot of people will be judging the extent of that resolve and commitment by the amount of spending that countries like Canada are, are prepared to do. Um, so I thought maybe we just take a quick second to consider this uh, almost unavoidable um, issue. You go back to uh, 2014 at the Wales Summit. The language in the summit on the whole question of uh, 2% was that uh, countries agreed, members agreed to uh, move, aim to move towards uh, a 2% guideline within a decade with a view to meeting their capability, their NATO capability targets and filling NATO's capability shortfalls. So that was 2014. This is 2024. The decade's expiring now. Um, and uh, it's true that some countries have improved uh, uh, with respect to the 2% target, I think most by increasing spending and not by reducing the size of their GDP. 
Um, so we're uh, in a situation now where uh, even if we assume that uh, Canada will increase its spending as set out in the DPU, uh, we still won't be at uh, the 2% of, of GDP target. And that's going to be a little bit um, more difficult uh, for the government to manage forward going forward. And I have to say that, um, you know, since 2014, neither uh, the, the, the previous government, the Harper government, which was in power at the time of the oil summit uh, and signed on to the earlier commitment or the successor government, uh, the current government, um, have laid out that, that kind of uh, plan to get to 2%. But last year at the NATO summit, um, the language had strengthened quite a bit. Uh, and it said, uh, we make uh, an enduring commitment to invest at least 2% of our GDP annually uh, on defense. Um, now, for countries that are already there, um, that's not that daunting a prospect. But for some of us, um, there's a question whether or not that's um, even, even realistic. Uh, so... Let me ask uh, each of you, uh, how important is 2% of GDP and uh, how uh, realistic is it that we can uh, get there um, maybe before another decade expires? Um, Stephanie, why don't, why don't we start with you this time? Hey, thank you. I think it's very important politically and symbolically. In practice, maybe a little bit less important in terms of, of the timeline when, when you get there, because I think for an alliance like NATO, it's always about what have you done for me lately. So even if you're meeting that 2% threshold, you have to show that you are contributing to the operations and being an active member of the alliance and so on. But I think that when Canada signs on to these pledges on behalf of Canadians, uh, there is a, a, a political and symbolic cost to reneging on those pledges or not meeting the commitments that are made. And the language last year, and I'm glad that you, you read uh, exactly the commitments that we signed on to because words are very important in that context. And the language from last year is indeed uh, quite uh, forceful when compared to 2014. So in that respect, in terms of laying a plan to get to the 2%, uh, the defense policy update did fall short. So I'm hoping that there's still a few announcements in Canada's back pocket that have been saved strategically for the summit. So if not, you know, talk directly to the 2%, at least being able to show more things on the table, uh, new information, new, new capabilities. Uh, that being said, I, I do worry about some of the more structural problems with Canadian defense. So no matter what type of pledge Canada is signing on to, uh, there is another that commitment that uh, even more urgent is uh, the, the personnel uh, piece. So this shortfall in military personnel that uh, the Canadian Armed Forces is facing is really concerning. And in order to uh, be able to fulfill uh, the more operational commitments that Canada has signed on to and over the long term, uh, that piece needs to be addressed uh, urgently. And so thinking through uh, solving military personnel recruitment and retention uh, in short order uh, is, is very important in order to uh, continue to be seen as a reliable ally across operations and uh, needing to look at you know, how we're increasingly relying on, on the reserves uh, and how the defense policy update also looks to other strategies like in increasing the participation of, of civilians in defense. So we're maybe not quite at the stage that Vin suggested in terms of looking at our uh, Nordic allies and, and the reinstatement of mandatory military service, but we will have to look creatively if uh, we can implement the pledges that we're signing on to. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, Carrie, uh, I'll ask you to comment on this, but maybe you, you could also just touch on the other part of the commitment, the the. Yeah. The commitment for the 20 percent uh, that we're all supposed to be spending on major new equipment, uh, including uh, on R&D activities. Um, you know, I'm struck that uh, while we see some progress on major new equipment uh, things, our, our Arctic and offshore patrol ships, for example, are, are slowly coming out of line. One of them was in Havana two weeks ago. Um, so we, we see some some evidence of that. Uh, but then other major uh, 
uh, investments like uh, replacements for the existing submarine fleet still seem to be, uh, you know, pretty much on the drawing board and, and a long way from uh, uh, any real expenditure of uh, of funds. So, um, how important is the is the the twenty percent uh, uh, investment in in new equipment, um, and how likely is that to to help move Canada forward uh, in the next few years? The NATO guideline that uh, NATO allies should spend 20% of their defense budget on either major new equipment or research and development. Um, in a way, it's a more important metric from my perspective because it has a bit more to do with military effectiveness. It also has more to do with NATO adapting to um, uh, respond to some of those emerged domains like cyber and space, et cetera, where, you know, getting ahead of a technological curve is absolutely imperative. So it's a really important metric. Um, the 2% metric has become almost totemic and it carries more political weight. Um, but Canada going into the summit would be very, very tactically smart to announce that they're reaching 2% going into the summit. Maybe they'll announce 2%. Maybe they'll announce 2% with a date. Ideally, they'd announce 2% with a date, a year to reach that, plus a plan. That would be the ideal. Why is it tactically smart? The big looming what if is the American election. Trump has already threatened 10% or higher tariffs on any ally who doesn't meet the NATO defense spending guidelines. If the presidency were to go to Donald Trump again, we, sitting where we sit right now, would be incredibly vulnerable. Where do we sit right now? In We're the only country that's deep in what I call the quadrant of shame. I'm borrowing that from Dave Perry. Thank you, Dave. But it's looking at countries that don't meet the 2% and don't meet the 20%. And we're the lowest of the low there. Now, we shouldn't be too ashamed. We're still, I think, seventh in terms of you know real dollars spending on defense because we're actually a big country. Um, but the fact is that we're causing ourselves great problems with the bilateral relationship with the U.S., not just with Trump, but under the current president, too. You saw that letter from Congress to Prime Minister Trudeau. The relationship with the U.S. has to be managed. It's not only about trade, folks. So we really have to pay attention to that. It will hurt us if we don't step up. It hurts us at the NATO table. Yes, you get to have a voice and a veto regardless of how much you pay. But the fact is your political leverage at the table, and I saw it, your political leverage at the table is less if you are seen to be not contributing your fair share. And we are seen to be not contributing our fair share. And then the last thing is, uh, we talked you know, earlier about the threats that are actually facing Canada. The rust out and the understaffing in defense is going to hurt us directly in those security vulnerabilities that we Canadians have right now. So we got to pay more. Yep. Well, thank you uh, for that, Terry. Um, and there's some good points there. And we may have to do another broadcast, another podcast someday to, to pick up on some of the issues like um, uh, the undermanning and the, the recruitment and retention challenges and uh, it, we haven't. We've talked about equipment. But we haven't talked much about infrastructure. So there are a lot of things that we could we can roll into a to a future discussion. Vince, um, did you have any uh, thoughts about the two percent? Sure, I think that um, both Carrie and Stephanie have raised some some excellent points. I mean, let's not forget that we got the defense update out, <clears throat> which I have to say, I personally was shocked. I didn't think we were ever going to see it, or we ever going to see the light of day. I don't think there's any doubt that they got it out because they wanted it out before the NATO summit. They wanted to get it out to, to help appease the United States. So you know, there's some good news there. And I think especially on the Arctic, and as was previously referenced, the Western flank or the Northern flank, we can we can play that up as long as we follow through on all these commitments. But there's no doubt that the 2% is is going to be the 800-pound gorilla in, in the room. Um, you know, there's this great debate about it's just an arbitrary figure. I remember writing briefing notes when I was in my early days at B&B saying that percentages don't buy tanks or airplanes or, or ships and that <laughs> actual money 
uh, is required to, to buy capability. It's all about capability. But it's really beside the point because we've made the commitment. Um, as a NATO member, we have signed up to reach 2%. So whether we like it or not, we need to do it. It, 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 is, a, it is a commitment that all NATO members have signed up to now. Um, we are in the quadrant of shame. I think that Stoltenberg announced just last week that there are well over 20 NATO members now, uh, above 2%. There were just a few in, back in 2014. I mean, we're looking really, really bad here. So I think that we do have to, we do have to, to step up to the, to the, to the plate. So I agree with Kerry. I mean, it's not going to happen overnight, but at the very least announce that there's a path and that there's a year. I mean, the minister keeps on saying, Minister of National Defense, that they're going to, you know, when they announce that they've got submarines, that they're going to buy submarines, that's going to put us over 2%. I don't know if we're going to get a submarine announcement ahead of Washington. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Um, But say that we've got a plan, we've got a path, we're going to get to 2% by whatever it is, whether it's 2030 or 2035, I mean, hopefully sooner rather than later. I think Kerry makes a really good point about the U.S. It's not just about NATO. It's not just about NATO allies writ large, but it's about the U.S. And it's interesting, Kerry, you said it's not just about trade, but there's that that trade security linkage. I mean, we've got Kuzma renegotiation coming up in 2026. And if it is Trump, uh, if we're not if we're not playing on the security side, if we're not doing our two percent bit, I think that'll play into other aspects of the relationship, including on the trade side. It's going to hurt us right across the board. So we really we really do have to to do well in that in that regard. But it's not, it's, it's, it's going to be that inner pound gorilla, but there's other stuff we can do. So again, it would be nice on the 20% if we could, if we could get above the 20% line. And I think other announcements on Ukraine, um, you know, we, we announced our, our uh, security agreement with Ukraine earlier this year. I think we pointed up to the bar with 3 billion for 2024. I wonder if we're going to get an announcement for some more money for 2025, 2026 down, down the road. So coming back or to that long-term commitment. Um, you know, what are we, what are we going to do and lock into Latvia? I don't know when we're due up in Latvia. Um, I, I think right now it's, it's, it's fairly soon, 2026, something like that. Can we make an announcement to the effect that we'll, we'll be there again for the, for the long term? So there are other things we can do, but if we don't do anything on 2%, uh, we're going to get hammered and, and in my view, justifiably so. Well, thank you, Vince. Um, I'm going to have to call, uh, close to this session. Uh, I want to thank uh, all three of you for uh, your really helpful and um, insightful comments. Uh, I'll be watching uh, the activities at the summit uh, with a scorecard to see how accurate any of you were in your uh, in your predictions. Um, and I won't be the only one because I noticed uh, that earlier today, uh, the government announced that the change of command ceremony for the new chief of the defense staff will take place on July the 18th. Uh, so there will be someone else who will be very interested uh, in the outcomes of that uh, in that outcome of that uh, summit. So uh, thank you very much again for your uh, your contributions. Uh, I hope we get a chance to do this again after the summit, uh, so we can uh, uh, see uh, how how accurate you all were. Uh, and uh, I look uh, very much forward to having a further conversation with all of you when that comes. Uh, have a great day. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. That's all for this week's episode of the CDA Institute Expert Series. To learn more about the CDA Institute, you can visit our website at www.cdainstitute.ca or subscribe to our newsletter. Stay tuned for more NATO Summit coverage coming up this week and next. Thanks, and we hope you'll be tuning in next time.